Good morning. Um, good afternoon in Australia, or good evening, maybe. All right, so what I'm, what I'm going to talk about is, after my 25 years of looking at this sort of data, I mean, I, I've got to learn that CFS people don't have all the same symptom outcome. They might have similar onsets, and when you look at them, there's a and you do factor analyses, you find out there's a depressive set, and you find there's a pain set, and you find there's a, there's a set with, with lots of um, sort of taste and smell and, and symptom exaggeration and such as that. So th there must be some explanation for that. And um, I'll get the right button in a minute. All right, first of all, I better um, give a list of all my collaborators, um, and they're all listed up there. We have a set of scientists in the top two, low, top two rows. Most of us are involved in the Bio21 Institute, and then we've got two clinician groups that, that provide us with patients. And they're probably the most valuable of all, because if we can't collect patients that are appropriately qualified, uh, classified and all that, well, we don't have anybody to study, which is a bit of a problem I've noticed around here, isn't it? Yeah. So, so after all, analysing all of that data, what, what I realised is that, and there, there are studies out there now that show that we are actually dealing with a, what appears to be a heterogeneous event, not a single a single thing. We define them according to a symptom set and that basically is we define that predominantly on fatigue. So if we analyse if we analyse fatigue as, as a thing, what we find is that there's clusters of things that go with that. We find that something like 50% of the patients may in fact have pain syndromes or fibromyalgics but the others don't. There's a whole cluster of them that are that are cognitively impaired, but the others don't seem to have that. And it's a bit hard to see this writing down here, so I apologise. So, so what we really want to know is why are these different? Is there some... If they have a similar onset and a different outcome, that can only be explained by a difference in their genetic response or some change to pathogen or other um, epigenetic types of issues that may actually drive the event. So if we look, if we do some simple regression analyses, like in other words, we use a sophisticated statistical technique to look at how the patients score their fatigue scores, and then we look at the metabolome, what we find is the predominant thing that we see in our data set or the first of morning samples, where we actually find the glucose that are elevated. Probably we did them um, postprandial or after meals, we, we will get some variation in that. And that seems to be the metabolome ones from over here seem to have, because they're not restricted in the same manner as we, we do. If we look at fatigue, what we find it, it's related to a glycolytic change and it's related predominantly to the glucose level in the serum. But if we turn around and then we look at the ones with fibromyalgia type pain syndromes and we look at the, the amount of widespread pain they have, we find that it's quite a different event metabolically. We see there's a change in kidney function. We see that they're during these the, the, when the pain is worse, they've urinated out more amino acids, they've lost more electrolyte, and we can actually show that. The, prob the problem with seeing that in chronic fatigue syndrome people is we only see them after six months, because that's what the definition tells us. But because we've actually seen other, other pain syndrome clusters at their time of onset, we actually see these quite a different set of changes and when you put them together you can actually understand what, what the relationship is. So basically what I'm going to try and do now is look at the, the, the genetics of it and to see whether we can tease out sort of things that, that may indicate some of these sorts of things. So 
we did a, we're currently doing a pilot study, so it's unpublished data, so nobody's going to tell anybody, is that right? <laughs> um, so what, what came out of that is that we took 56 patients in 32 controls, we used um, a, data, a data set, uh, I think the Kenny DiMerlio study did used a, a, a DNA chip chasing um, immune changes. What we've got here is one that just changes general, general chem chemistry. So they're quite different sets, but what we ended up with um, was 316 SNPs that were, or mutation points that were different. Of those, um, 300, sorry, 162 were in known um, genes or protein production. 16% uh, of them were in what we call RNA genes. These genes actually regulate or are known to regulate how, how the DNA is transcribed down to a protein, um, um, usually in the cell down to, to the messenger RNA, which exits from the nucleus. So if there's anomalies in those or there's um, viral interference with or they, where they make a, a small protein, it may interfere with that process and that may alter the transcription of the, um, the, the final proteins. We also found that 33% of them were potentially junk according to the old definitions. But what we also now know is that some of those potential junk DNA actually do things, and we can see that they act, act as promoters for genes. We can see that some of them may actually have enhancing functions, so what they do is when they get activated, they, they will enhance the production of a particular gene. Now, one of the problems we noticed with a couple of studies is, because the control groups are so small, the important thing was for us to make sure that our, our control group wasn't biased. So, in other words, we went to the 1,000 Genomes data set and we compared every SNP of everything that we had and looked for any of those that, that, that where our control group may be aberrant or if our CFS group matched the normal distribution, all of those got eliminated. Um, so we basically ended up with... So the other thing we did was we removed any of them that, that didn't have a, what we call an odds ratio of two. So in other words, they were more than twice as likely to be present in the CFS group compared with the control. So if they were less than twice as likely, they also got eliminated because that means they're probably not as important. We can go back and look at those later, but the important thing is that we don't get biased in the beginning. So we ended up with a data set um, of 38 genes, which is not a lot when you actually think about it, out of, the, out of the huge lot that were potentially there. So the first thing we did was we wanted to see is there relationships between the genes. So um, what we did was we did factor analysis and I did what I call layered factor analysis, where you, you divide the group into two, three, four, five, and, and you look at w what the what products and, 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 and combinations come out of that. And what we found was there was at least seven major clusters. The first one was an anomaly in G protein coupled receptors, receptor proteins. The second and the third ones were the, the same combination, but in, in combination with a couple of other or, or additional genes. So whether these other genes were probably amplifiers, modifiers, or things that may relate to symptom expression, they were suspicious that's the case. Then the, the fifth, sorry, the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh all involved RNA helicases. Now what these do is they, they remove viral and bacterial and and our host RNA out of the cell. And you'll see that some of those had some additional genes that they were present with. So when we, we just, 
looked at a couple of the individual SNPs that were there, and what we what we found is some of these had between, around five were fivefold more likely to be present in the chronic fatigues, and down the bottom, some of them were present in heterozygotes. So in other words, they may be they may be autosomal dominant. Or some, and others were they were present in, in the homozygote state were they more likely to be more disabled or recessive. And we can see the G proteins and the, the, the last lot is a thing called Langerin and I'll talk about that in a minute. So what we just simply did was we took all, all the mutations within the genes that had, had lo, low prevalence within the community. We just did a simple addition um, we then did a simple addition to find out how, off, how frequent they were, and what we found is that the Langerin was threefold more likely, the G proteins were 21.5 fold more likely, and the RNA heliaxes were 12.6 fold more likely. Anybody with an odds ratio of two is, as a scientist is usually pretty happy, but when you get bigger ones like this, you're quite ecstatic sometimes. A G protein basically is constructed out of three components, alpha, beta, and gamma. And they, they, there's something like there's 20 alphas, five betas, and something like 12 or 13 gammas. And, and different tissue distribution of those determines how they respond in various tissues. What, what basically happens is the when the receptor gets activated, the beta and gamma separate, that's sort of the alpha and the beta and gamma separate and they go and perform separate functions. Um, and we, we look at what G proteins do, what we find is that they, they affect taste, smell, um, mood, inflammatory issues, um, blood, blood pressure, blood pressure, heart rates, uh, water balance, electrolytes, and, and visual. Now, if we start thinking about our, our ME-CFS patients, we can see lots of people with lots of those sorts of things. So I think we're beginning to think, or at least I think, that some of these may be critically important in symptom expression of the type we see w within the symptom cluster, within this, the cluster. Very quick one about RNA helicases. What they do, in essence, is they remove double-stranded DNA, viral RNA, host RNA out of the cytoplasm. They are inhibited by viruses, by viruses joining to the epidermal growth factor. And that, what they basically, these potentially could be the major reason for the viral triggers, where they interfere with, if we're not able to remove the viral RNA. The CD, the Langerin or CD207 gene, uh, what it is is expressed on dendritic cells, in the gut, on the skin, in the throat, and basically it is a receptor for pathogens. So if, if we have problems in this, we're, we're going to have particular problems in detecting certain viruses, etc. What we know in, with HIV studies that they uh, the, those where they've actually inhibited Langerin, they've had greater um, viral loads and they've had more in infections within the, within the body. If we look at the viruses that can be transported or transmitted or acquired by this receptor, we see HIV, HSV1, HSV2, EBV, in other words, a long, long list of ones that we know interfere with um, uh, CFS patients. Uh, we also did an analysis on the mitochondrial DNA. We found nothing. Um, there was, was sorry, we found one mutation in a that indicated haplogroup H5, um, and when we cross-checked that to think it was see whether it was a mitochondrial anomaly, what we actually found was that those were all of those were carriers of the the Langerin um, mutation set. So we, we think they, they just happen to be, they may actual fact be an indicator of a line of transmission of that particular gene group. So in summary, what we've, what we've got is 
by using a, a sort of a slightly different approach, we, we have been able to identify a number of potential genes. There's certainly a gene cluster associated with G-coupled proteins. Uh, there's a gene cluster related to RNA helicases, and there's a gene cluster related to Langerin. Now, clearly, th this data may be nothing. <laughs> but we have to make sure that this is, makes sense and it's not no sense. Thank you.